this morning. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Our bridge kids are dismissed at this time. Grade levels K through 5. Um, your teachers, they are waiting on you, and so you can go at this time. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, beginning with verse number 16. Ecclesiastes chapter number 3, beginning with verse number 16. Here's how it reads. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. In the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. But what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so does the other, dies the other. And they all have the same breath. And man has no advantage over the beast for all is vanity. All go to one place. All are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Chapter 4, verse 1. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of the oppressed. And they had no one to comfort them. On the side of the oppressors, there was power. And there was no one to comfort them. And I thought the dead who are already dead are more fortunate than the living who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. The fool folds his hands and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Justice for all. You may have your seat. The preacher in Ecclesiastes 3, he begins with this poem by saying that there is a time and a season for every matter under heaven. And he resolves to let us know that God is the one who is in control of the times and the seasons of life. And so now he moves on here in chapter 3. Because we've got other things to carry on, I want to jump right in and get to the meat of the matter this morning. The preacher opens, first of all, by addressing the problem of injustice. He opens this section by addressing the problem of injustice. Injustice. Look with me first of all as he addresses this problem of injustice at the preacher's recognition. Look at what he recognizes in verse 16. He says, Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. The preacher recognized that there was injustice and unrighteousness in the courtroom. The very place where you expect to find justice was the place of injustice. We, we expect the courtroom to be the place where there will be righteous verdicts and judgments. But instead, what the preacher observed was that the innocent were being found guilty and the guilty were being found innocent. 
The innocent were being punished for crimes that they did not commit. And the guilty were going unpunished. Now notice something here, because we're about to go in. That the preacher is not addressing injustice on an interpersonal level. He's addressing systemic injustice. The, the institutions that have been put in place to, to, to provide justice are the institutions and the systems that are the cause of injustice. And he says, when I look at the systems and the institutions that are to provide justice, he says they were guilty of injustice. And look at what he calls injustice. He says it is wickedness. The word for wickedness is, can be translated evil. He says injustice is evil. That is his assessment on what he recognizes, on what he observes. And the thing that hurts my heart, that, 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 that breaks my heart, is that in the church we cannot agree that all injustice is evil. Everybody looks at me and they say, all right, Brandon, you want to have a multi-ethnic church? You want to, to foster racial reconciliation? What's the solution? And friends, we're going too fast. Before we can come up with a solution, we must first come to an agreement on what the problem actually is. And in the church, we have not yet determined. We cannot agree on what exactly injustice is. And so he says, there's injustice in the system. And friends, I'm, I'm here to tell you today that this was not only the preacher's problem, but this is still our problem today. There is still unjust systems and institutions in our world and in our country today. Let me give you some statistics. In America, according to to the U.S. Sentencing Project, the incarceration rate for whites is 450 inmates per 100,000 people. 450 inmates per 100,000 people for whites. The incarceration rate for blacks in America is 2,306 inmates per 100,000 Blacks make up 13, 14% of our population, but 60% of our prison population. According to the United States Sentencing Commission, black male offenders, their sentences were 20% longer than those of white male offenders for the same crime. Hispanic male offen offenders' sentences were 5% longer than their white male offenders. Friends, there is a problem in our country on how we enforce laws and how we punish offenders. And our Pledge of Allegiance promises liberty and justice for all. Now, unfortunately, the statistics say that justice is only being experienced by some. And the preacher in our text says, this reality is evil. It is said, another report said that minorities, blacks, Hispanics, are three times more likely to be searched for when there is a traffic stop than their white counterparts. There's something wrong in our system. And friends, as followers of Christ, the statistics that I just shared should make your blood boil. There should be righteous indignation around the issues of injustice. But friends, being angry is not enough. 
We must pray, we must fight, and we must, as followers of Jesus Christ, be champions for justice. Some of you are not going to like this part of the sermon because you're going to say, I'm being too political. Friends, what I'm preaching about is not a political issue. This is a gospel issue. Well, y'all surprised me. I wasn't expecting that many, but thank you. <laughs> you don't pay me, and you don't show up every Sunday for me to give you my opinion on my politics. And that would offend you, and you should not show up here Sunday after Sunday for my opinion. Friends, what I'm sharing with you is God's heart on this matter. How is this a gospel issue? gospel issue. Jesus chastised the Pharisees. These are the people. These are the churches of churchy people. They, they are zealous for God's law, and he chastises them. He says, you tithe. By the way, what you tithe is dill, mint, and cumin, which are the smallest uh, herbs there are, by the way. You tithe, but you've neglected justice and faithfulness. This is Jesus. Micah chapter 6 verse 8 says, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice. I didn't make it up. This is in the Word, church. Justice is a gospel issue. And so when we hear injustice, our, our gospel ears ought to perk up and say, I at least need to listen and learn. The easy thing to do is to say, Nope, they were wrong, he's right. And instead of doing our research, now I don't want you to jump to conclusions. I don't want you to jump to conclusions when you hear issues of injustice. All I'm saying is put on your gospel lenses and your gospel ears and listen, learn, research, and then come to a conclusion. Because justice is at the heart of the gospel. Injustice, friends, is an affront to all people being created in the image of God. We must move. That's the preacher's recognition. Look at the preacher's reflection. So, so what he does is, he says, I make this observation, and now, what does all this mean for me? What the preacher does here in verses 17 through 19 is he zooms out, and he puts on his eternal glasses. He begins to think eternally rather than temporally. Friends, it's so easy to be overwhelmed by the injustice and all the evil of this world. I want to throw in the proverbial towel. And he says, I got to take an eternal view here. here. In verse 17, he says, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every matter and for every work. Friends, the sad reality is that everyone would not see justice on this side of heaven. And the reason we should not be hopeless is because we serve a God who has promised to make all things right. Justice will be served. And we can trust God that he will make things right in the end. We must remember that our confidence is not in a system or an institution but it's in the chief justice, Jesus Christ. Acts 17, verse 31 says, God has fixed the day when he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Justice will be served one way or the other. His second reflection He's now focusing on God rather than just the issues of the world because he's looking at under the sun. And so to get an eternal perspective, he has to look above the sun. And so now he's talking about God. He says God has a time when he's going to judge all the world, the righteous and the wicked. Now he says also God is testing man. That word for testing is, it, it means also to prove. God is proving or showing mankind that they are mortal. What do you mean? Because he says, we're no different from animals in the sense that we have the same fate in destination. We both have the same fate in that both will die. And we both have the same destination in that we're both going back to dust. 
Mortality has a way of helping us put life in perspective. It, ha, ha, notice that when people have a brush with death, or they're on their deathbed, they begin to see life differently. And so God is proving to us, don't forget, you're just mortals. Death is the great equalizer, so let me give you, help you see from a different perspective now. And so then, the preacher's recognition, the preacher's re reflection, here's the preacher's resolution. Enjoy what you're doing. The preacher, he's looked at the past, there's injustice. Then he goes to the future, we're all going to die, we're all going to dust, we're not sure what happens. Remember, there's progressive revelation in Scripture, so he, he, he doesn't dress the resurrection and Jesus coming, so he's, he, he's just unsure of the future. So he says, being unsure of the future, I know we're going to die, and I know we're going to dust, I don't know what happens after that. He says, live in the present by enjoying what you're doing. Whatever you do, enjoy it. Don't despair. Don't give up. There's no way of knowing what will happen after we die. So enjoy God's gift in the present. He moves from the issue of injustice, and now he says, let's talk about the problem of oppression. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. The preacher's recognition in the problem of oppression, chapter 4, verse 1 says, again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold the tears of the oppressed and, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of the oppressors, there was power. There was no one to comfort them. The word for oppression, church, means to wrong, to extort, to exploit. In the Bible, it includes cheating one's neighbor, robbing your neighbor, fraud, not paying workers the worthy do, neglecting or taking advantage of the disadvantage. In the more historical context, it would include in how we care for the orphan, the widow, the poor, the immigrant. Oppression is seeking gain or profit without regard to the needs of others. And friends, The more things change, the more things stay the same. In our land, there is still oppression. The poor are getting poor. The wealth gap between the wealthy and the poor continues to increase. Women are paid less than men for the same work. Orphans are still neglected. Friends, we have kids waiting for homes, but if we all just were obedient in the church at large to James 127, which says this is true and pure and undefiled religion, which is to care for the widows and the orphans in their distress, if we would do that, there would be waiting lines of homes. I'm just talking about the oppression in our land. Executive pay continues to skyrocket while wages for the average worker remain stagnant. We have failing school systems. We want people to get off welfare where education is liberation. And so then we must be investing in our schools. But yet they are subpar. They're sex trafficking. There's disregard for human rights, genocide. Oh, I'm going to make some real enemies. This is an awful sermon for, to start a capital campaign for a new church. <laughs> we now live in a land, in a country, where health care is a luxury. It's unaffordable. Help me, Jesus. Friends, this is a pro-life issue. And that's all I'll say about that. 
The saddest part of what the preacher observes when he talks about this oppression, he says there is no one to comfort them. In other words, all this oppression and, and injustice is happening in the land and nobody cares. Nobody's concerned. Nobody's speaking up for the voiceless. No one is intervening for the oppressed. No one is there to give them comfort. No one's using their influence and their privilege and their network and their power to advocate for the oppressed. So this is what the preacher recognizes. This is his reflection. Looking at all the oppression of the son, his first reflection is, this is such a sad reality reality that the dead are better off than the living. Who would want to live in the midst of all this oppression and injustice? He goes even further. He says, not only that, better off than both are those who have yet to even, who have ever been born. That's just how bad the oppression was. He says, the root cause of all of this Verse 4, then I saw that all toil and all skill come from a man's envy of his neighbor. Trying to keep up with the Joneses. Wanting what your neighbor has. And I just don't want what they have. I want it to be better than what they have. If they have a 1080p TV, I want a 4K TV. They've got a 50 inch, I've got to have a 75 inch. If they live in a three bedroom, I've got to have, if I'm gonna have a three bedroom, it's gotta have three bathrooms at least. It's envy of our neighbor. And all it leads to is competition and comparison. Envy of our neighbor leads us to disobey the, the, the core of the great commandment. To love our neighbor as ourselves. He says the root of injustice and oppression is a man's envy of his neighbor. As we, as we climb up the pro, pro, proverbial ladder of success, we don't care who we step on to get there. He says, this is all pointless, meaningless, vanity, a grasping after the wind. And as I've told you before, comparison, friends, is the thief of contentment. So, so what's the preacher's resolution? Look at verse 5 and 6 in chapter 4, then I'm done. In verse 5, he says, the fool folds his hands and eats his flesh. Verse 6, better is a handful of quietness and two hands full of toil and striving after the wind. Say, what? The preacher saying, it takes hands to work. And so there's two extreme responses here. The fool, instead of using his hands to work, he folds his hands together and does nothing. He opts for laziness. Or he opts out of the workforce altogether. He says the result is eating your flesh because you have nothing else to eat. For us, that may mean eating up our savings account. The preacher's resolution comes in verse 6. He says, better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and striving after the wind. Look at the imagery here. My daughter, Brianna, Loves candy. She loves sweets. So whenever I have some candy to give her, actually, whenever I have candy, she assumes that it's also for her. And so she comes to me to get some candy, not with one hand out, but two hands. Because if I just use one hand, I'm only going to get so much candy. But if I get two hands together, 
If I use both of my hands, I can cup them together, and I can get a whole lot more candy. I can accumulate more with two hands. And the preacher is saying, we've got a, the other extreme is you're going to use both of your hands to accumulate more, to work harder. If on one hand, the extreme is laziness. On the other hand, it's workaholism. And he said, the most appropriate response is a handful of quietness. That word quietness means rest, tranquility, peace. In other words, work. But work so that you can also enjoy the fruit of your labor. The workaholic just keeps working. We're going to hear more of this next week. He doesn't have time to enjoy it. He neglects friends and family. But it's better to work, but also have time to enjoy the fruit of your labor. Watch this. And to rest. Friend, rest is a value that has escaped our society. We, all, we like to be on the move. We've made ourselves so busy that we don't take the time for rest and reflection, and it is hurting us as a society. This past week, last week, or I told our bridge group, I said, guys, I'm living off fumes. I'm tired. I need to take a couple of weeks off. I said, I don't even, I it's hard for me to even get excited about Bridge Group just because I'm just tired. And, and, and that was hard for me to share and admit. I'm the one who came up with this whole system of Bridge Groups and stuff. Then I received a text message from someone in our church said, I wanted to encourage you today. Don't feel like you have to apologize for following Jesus' example. He himself took rest away from people. I know you probably feel like you're always on for people. Be like Jesus and get your rest. Thank you, Rose. I needed that. And guys, that's my word for somebody in here today. Don't work so hard. Don't get so caught up in the rat race that you forget time to rest. Remember, one of the Ten Commandments is to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. The point is you need time off from work to rest and reflect. So here's a practical application from this part of the sermon. Take your vacation day. I'm done. Jesus was a champion for justice. That's why he went to the cross. Because we broke God's holy law and, and righteous law and justice demanded death. So Jesus became our substitute on the cross and he died to satisfy the justice of God so that we could be forgiven of sins and receive eternal life. So if you are here today and you have never trusted in Jesus Christ, the, the application for you is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ because you are, you are guilty of breaking God's holy and righteous and just laws. And because of that, you were served punishment, which is death, eternal separation from God and hell. But God has made a way so that Jesus Christ satisfies his justice and you can be right with your creator. For all of us then. An application is we must become champions of justice. Not only should we become champions of justice, but we should also value our work, enjoy our work, but take appropriate times for rest, to enjoy the fruit of our labor, to share the fruit of our labor with those around us. Stop comparing and competing with other people. The preacher says it's all vanity. Father, thank you for what our eyes have seen, our ears have heard. God, 
Forgive us for being like these people who would not comfort those who were experiencing injustice and oppression. God, break our heart for what breaks yours. Give us a holy discontentment with injustice and oppression and all of its shape and forms. God, forgive us for seeking our own interests and not putting the interests of others above our own. Forgive us for not loving our neighbor as ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.